Can everyone hear me okay? All right, yeah, I can talk louder, please. Just let me know if you can't hear. Uh, all right, so, okay, so today we're talking about factoring integers. Uh, uh, pretend there's a slide here that it asks the people to, to give meetings. So if, again, if you're interested in giving meetings, um, let us know. I know it's people have already reached out. Um, again, you don't need like, you don't need like a whole bunch of experience or anything. Or, and you can also, and we also have options to give like shorter meetings, like 10 or 15 minutes, if that's something that you'd be more comfortable with. It's a good, good experience. Uh, all right, let's get started. So, um, so the problem today, uh, so we have some large positive manager and we want to factor it. Right? Uh, so it's pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, and unfortunately for us, if there's, uh, there's actually no, no known polynomial time algorithm in the number of bits. All right. So, um, so you know, it's not known if there's a way to solve it in polynomial time. It would be a pretty big deal if there was. Um, but but right now the best we can do is something something slow. Uh, a lot of times we'll assume n is composite. Uh, so like we're not we're not going to determine if it's prime in the process. Uh, we can check if it's prime in polynomial time. Um, so but, we'll just, but sometimes like a lot of times we'll be looking for things that will assume n is composite. And and uh, so one application of factoring a really large number is for RSA encryption, which uh, and the security of an RSA, uh, the security depends on the fact that factoring a really big number that's the product of two primes is really hard. So um, so we're not going to crack our RSA today, but uh, we'll see kind of where we are. Uh, and what, what the best algorithms are at the moment and how we got there. All right, so the most straightforward standard algorithm is just to do trial division. So that is just try all the numbers from uh, both less than n and see if you get a factor. Um, uh, so you just divide by all everything up to, you just need to check out the squared of n. And if you don't find anything, then n is prime. So, uh, unfortunately, this is, uh, if you express it in the number of bits, um, it's still uh, an exponential running time. So, uh, and this is really not a bad algorithm. Um, like, I mean, considering there's no polynomial time solution, like this is actually, and it's actually an okay. But this, uh, we can do, we can do a lot better. So, uh, yeah, by the way, if you guys have any questions at any point, just feel free to stop me. Uh, I mean, I, I know like, like, like it'll get it'll start going pretty quickly pretty soon. So I'm um, just letting you know. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so for Mott's algorithm, uh, so like one idea to improve is let's, so we write n as um, the product of two odd numbers, right? Um, and then we write, we do the substitution a equals x plus y b equals x minus y so that we get this difference of squares um, with expression that equals n um, and we can always do this if a and b are both odd uh, and then we can try values of x that make x squared minus n equal to the perfect square so, um, and we start from, from, from at least square root of n so that, you know, x squared minus n is positive. Uh, okay. So consider, uh, here's just a quick example, n equals 1,081. We start from 33. We try squaring 33 squared, 34 squared, 35 squared. And you see the difference on the right. Um, and you see 144 is a perfect square. So, uh, so x equals, for x equals 35, y equals 12, um, we get a solution to this, to the equation of y squared equals x squared minus n. And so you can recover 
uh, the original A and B as we define those. So A is 47, B is 23. And sure enough, 47 times 23 is 1,080. So you can do this little substitution trick to get the difference of squares and then and, and look for a square this way. And, uh, so any questions so far? So, uh, so if the factor are near the square root of n, then this algorithm is actually is pretty fast, right? Because we just stuck, because that means x is near square root of n. So we won't have to look very long for, uh, for a solution. Um, but if the factors are really far from square root of n, like let's say, you know, you had something like three times some really large number, uh, you could, or or like two times a really large number, you could be looking for uh, from you, you could be looking from square root of n to some 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 number that's you know a constant factor of n. Uh, so and so in the worst case, it's you're going to end up doing O of n operations. Um, so uh, so like so it's good in some scenarios, but it's uh, in the worst case, it's not very good. Uh, and there's ways to, to to optimize this. So you can you can like skip. There's some ways to skip x that won't work. There's some ways to guess where the primes are going to be. Uh, you can also use this algorithm for a little bit and then change back the trial division, and it, and it, and, it, and it's better than using either one alone. But uh, really, this is not that great of one. Uh, so let's see how we can do better. Good question. Was your hand up or? Oh, I don't, okay, sorry. I just I just saw something in. I was like, I didn't know. Right. So this is uh, Dixon's algorithm. So, um, so let's. Uh, so everyone, so can can you show up hands? Who here is familiar with modular arithmetic? Okay. All right. So yeah. So I'll just briefly. Uh, so modular arithmetic is. The idea is considering the remainder when you divide by some some n. So when I say mod n, that means just the remainder after going to n. And when I, I say two things are equivalent, um, that's the th the three horizontal lines, um, like like here. Where if uh if both have the same remainder, we divide by n. Right. So. Um, so instead of when I say x, so if x squared, so we loosen our conditions a little bit and look for x squared minus y squared to be just a multiple of n. And, and so what that means, so x squared minus y squared zero mod n means that the remainder when you divide x squared minus y squared by n is just zero, which is exactly what it means to be a multiple of n. Um, and then so with modular arithmetic, you can do a lot of uh, pretty, Pretty, uh, you know, usual addition, multiplication, subtract operations. So, um, so you just add y squared both sides, and you get x squared and y squared have the same remainder mod n. And then, right. so there's some things we can try to do this, right? So one thing we could try is just to try a bunch of pairs of x and y, um, but such that x squared and y squared are the same remainder. But there are a lot of different remainders that you could end up with. Uh, these remainders, like we call them quadratic residues because they're what's left over after you square. So uh, that's where the name comes from. Uh, and, and, and so there, yeah, there's a lot of different possible residues. So about like if n is just the product of two primes, if I'm not mistaken, it's about n over four. So you'll be looking for a long time to get a, a pair of x and y that just by trying pairs that have the same that give the same recipe. Um, you could also just try x and then reduce and then find the residue. So the so this is the remainder, uh, which is less than n, and see if that's a perfect square. Um, and this is kind of like Fermat's algorithm. You try x and then you see if if it gives you a valid y. Um, but unfortunately, there's not that many perfect squares with an n. It's only squared a squared of n of them. Uh, so it will take you a long time to actually 
for x squared, for the residue itself to be a perfect square. So you take x squared, you reduce it by n, you get something less than n. Uh, it could be pretty much anything as far as, as far as we as far we as, as far as we would know. And uh, and so we'd have to be pretty lucky to, to land on one. So it's also pretty uh, okay. This is the same slide again. Right. Uh, so maybe we can try something. Um, so let's say we have n equals this big number. And then uh, let's just say we're trying x. We're just squaring x. And we get, uh, and we and we get, so these are the remainders, 8,400 and 33,600. Um, and we, we factored them into primes. Uh, so, so, and so we, and so we want, we still want to get a perfect square on the right hand side, but, um, but you know, none of these are perfect squares. Anyone have any ideas on how you get a perfect square maybe? Out of the right hand sides. So right now, so right now the, the exponents, if you look at the exponents over here, is, you know the, they each have two odd exponents, so that's how in their prime factorization. So that's how you know that they're not perfect squares. Um, but if you multiply them, uh, you that's adding the exponents of the primes, and suddenly all the exponents are even. And so that means you get this perfect square right here. Um, this is cool. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, so we might not have a perfect square immediately just by squaring and taking the remainder, but we can combine these remainders to get a perfect square by looking at their prime factorization. Uh, so this is so we now have uh, yeah five thirteen and five thirty seven. Those are the x values we tried. And the square of those, um, when we multiply that together, uh, we get something that's equivalent to 16,800 squared. Um, and then, so to recover the original primes, we just use the difference of squares idea. So, uh, um, so you have, so 513 times 537 reduces at mod, mod n, and then you can do the difference of squares. And so there's some divisor of, uh, so hopefully, and hopefully these will give you two different divisors um, for, eight, for this, for n. Um, they might have some other, other factors thrown in there too. So you can take the, take the GCD with n um, of each of these, of each of these factors, All right. And so you get 163 and 521 as the divisors. Uh, uh, of this number. Uh, and so, yeah, we kind of pulled these, uh, we kind of pulled 513 and 537 out of nowhere. Um, and, you know, if you, but yeah, let's see. So, yeah, so the idea is we can find several residues, right? This product's a perfect square. Um, and instead of just finding one that happens to be a perfect square. Um, and you could just, Start squaring all the numbers, um, starting from square root of n, and you know, and keeping track of all the all the results. But it's really hard to piece together. Um, like you have you have a whole bunch of different um, you have a whole bunch of different residues. They'll all have a variety, a large variety of prime factors, um, and and also you have to factor them into their prime factor factorizations as well. So it's really hard to like check all the combinations of them. Uh, because it's, it's two to the power of however many you have so far, right? Uh, so what can we do? Uh, so this is what we had earlier. Um, and right, so, and yeah, so we can tell that the resulting exponents are even, right? So that's how we know, uh, again, that we'll, get, we'll have a square uh, when we multiply the two right-hand sides exponents are even. Uh, so we can we can try this, right? Um, and and yeah, this is as I just said, 
so this is the basic idea, but there's going to be way too many primes that'll appear. So let's just try to restrict our focus to a small number of primes. All right. And so we'll call this um, we'll call these primes our factor base. And so this so and we'll, and we'll just define the factor base by the upper bound on it. So we'll call it some bound B. So let's say like if B is seven, then we'll take the primes two, three, five, and seven. All right. And we'll do the same thing where we square a bunch of numbers to get the residues, but we're only but we'll, as we try to factor these residues, we're only going to care if they factor over the factor base. So that means all the prime factors are in our factor base and not some other big primes that we can't we don't want to deal with. Okay. So we'll be throwing out a lot of residues, but hopefully the ones that we're left with, we can work with more easily because there's fewer primes in them. So, um, and yeah, so the prime factors of what's left are all less than B. Uh, so we call the these residues B smooth. And, and then since they only have a small number of different prime factors, it should hopefully be easier to look at their exponents and find some find a way to combine them. Okay, such that the resulting exponents are even. All right. All right. So let's say n is forty one eighty three, uh, and we'll choose d equals eleven. So we have five primes in our factor base, um, and so the square root of n uh, rounds up to sixty five. So we'll just start from sixty five and start. Uh, we'll, we'll pick some some numbers. Uh, from, from between 65 and 48, okay, that are relatively small. Um, and so here are some numbers. Um, uh, you know, so of course you'll have to throw out a bunch of numbers that don't factor. Um, but here, and then here's what's left, right? So, uh, so you know, 65, you know, first of all, so x 65 squared is 42, 25. This is the remainder. Uh, mod n, that's the or the, the residue. And then this is the on the right is the factorization. And then so we repeat for all these values of x. Okay. Uh, all right, so now we have six of these. Um, and we want to find some way to combine, multiply the, the residues so that we get a perfect swing, right? So multiply some of these together uh, so that the exponents of each prime. The x one of each prime. Uh, so that looks kind of hard. But let's see. So um, let's write each of these as a column vector. So uh, and each each entry of the column vector is going to correspond to an exponent of one of the primes in the factor base. So this one for so for y equals twenty four fifty, right? This one here corresponds to the exponent of two. Uh, the zero corresponds to the exponent of the three, then the exponent of five, the exponent of seven, the exponent of 11. So since this is 22 times five squared times seven squared, um, we have the vector one, zero, two, two, zero. Makes sense. Okay. Uh, right. Now, so we can get a vector for each of these. Uh, so for each of these prime factorizations we have. Um, and so we have so we have these six column vectors. And so what does it mean to multiply two of the residues? Uh, so that's going to be adding the exponents in the prime factorization. Right? And so we, we have these six column vectors, and we want to find some way that we want to add some of them together that, so that the result is uh, so, so the resulting the result is all even, right? So, so every so yeah, so in other words, the result is zero mod two. Right? So you pick some of them, you add them together, and you get a result zero mod two. Uh, all right. Uh, so, so first, if we're only caring about whether the result is zero mod two, we might as well reduce all the vectors mod two. So, uh, uh, so it's the same. So these are the same vectors, but I just replaced two with zero and three with one. Um, 
it's reducing in mod two. And so, so yeah, so all, all the vectors, all the entries are now zero and one. And then, uh, and then we want to add some of them, right? To get, to get a vector of all zeros. So that means everything's even. And, and so we, so our values x1 through x6 correspond to whether we take each vector or not. So that's zero or one um, for what we do there. Okay. Uh, so if you think about it, this is really this is really just kind of five equations. Um, you know, there's one equation per per row of the vector, right? So the at the top you have you know x1 one times x1 plus zero times x2. Plus one times x three plus one times x four zero times x five zero times x six, and that's equal to zero. Okay, so you have so you have these five equations in six variables, um, and that's that's, uh, that's one more variable in equations. So you know, hopefully, we should be able to find a solution to this, um, and and because of that, right, so the vector uh, since there's uh, since there's six of these vectors, right? Um, and, and the five, um, and they're all five dimensional, right? They have five entries. Uh, so from linear algebra, you can say they're uh, they're lin they're linearly dependent, right? So that means uh, there's some there's, you can pick some some values of, for each of the x i's such that uh, that this such that the equation holds, other than them all being zero, right? If they're all zero, that means nothing, right? That just means we took none of the vectors, we took nothing. Uh, and we have a perfect square because the perfect square is just one. Um, but, 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 but we're guaranteed a non-trivial solution, right? So some combination of these vectors will give us all zero. And in this case, um, this is the solution, or this is one solution, um, at least. And so that means we take these two vectors here. Um, and you can see uh, if you add those two vectors together, the one plus one is just going to be zero mod two. Okay. So, and so you get so 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 yeah. So we picked enough, you know, we picked enough <laughs> vectors, right? We generated enough of these so that we, this would always have a solution. So that was that was the idea. So that's why I generated six specifically. Okay. Uh, so now we have. These two rows uh, that correspond to our solutions, and yeah, and so so now our job is most parties, uh, and so we have right. So we, we so, so this is the x values, um, and so we have ninety two, and then this is the this is the square, and then the residue. So we're multiplying the residues, ninety eight times twenty four fifty. Um, and from this, it's what two times five times seven squared squared, uh, yeah, four ninety squared. And then the left side, you have ninety two times one hundred four squared, which is twelve hundred two squared, um, mod forty one eighty three. And so you factor it again using difference of squares, and you recover the original factors using GCD. So any questions? Uh, so yeah, this is Dixon's algorithm. So given an input n, uh, first we're going to pick a factor base, uh, and then we're going to generate enough residues, and probably at least one more than the size of the factor base, uh, that factor over the factor. So we're just going to pick random numbers between square root of n and n and square root, and and try to factor them over the factor base. If we can't, then we throw them out. Right. And then and repeat until we have k plus one that works. Uh, and then we use the exponents to make our system of equations uh, mod two. Um, you can make it. You can write it as a matrix equation, um, and you can. And there's ways to solve this. Uh, you can use Gaussian elimination, or there's maybe some better methods for this particular problem. But you know, the Gaussian elimination works. And then you, you multiply, so you, and then you you know which residues uh, will actually give you a perfect square. You multiply them, and you recover the factors of n using our difference of squares trick. Yeah. What happens if you have factor base? Um, like if that won't 
one other factor in the play. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. you're saying if your factor base is too small. Yeah. Or your bound B is too small. Yes. So if your bound B is too small, uh, then the algorithm won't run won't run very well. Uh, you will be looking for a very long time for uh, residues that factor over the back of this. Okay. So you do have to pick an appropriate number for B. Um, yeah. Is there like a good way to know how big, like what size your factor base should be? Okay, yeah. Uh, I mean, so um, this is the next slide. So, yeah. Uh, and yeah, I don't like, like, I don't know, like, exactly you know, how this, there's a number about to show you. I don't know exactly how it's computed. Um, but but there, there is like a number that, you, that's, that we decided is appropriate. So, so, um, so yeah, so in terms of an analyzing this algorithm, uh, you know, it's not that easy, um, but there's dominated mainly by two things, which is one, trying to generate the residues. Uh, you know, it's, most of them won't factor over the factor base um, unless your factor base is huge. Um, but but then, but but then, if your factor base is huge, then you won't. Uh, you'll you'll have to generate a lot of residues. Okay. So, uh, but but this takes a long time, right? And and this part is, I guess, we call it the data collection, um, where, where you generate all these residues, and and then you attempt to factor them on the factor base again. If your factor base is huge, uh, that's also okay, right? If the factor base is just like a couple primes, I can just check. I can just divide it by these primes over and over again, and then if I if I still have left with something that's greater than one, then uh, then that means then I know it doesn't factor, right? Um, but if I if my factor base is huge, I have to keep checking all the primes in the factor base and try to factor and try to divide them. Uh, so yeah, so choosing the correct size of the factor base is pretty important. Um, uh, so it turns out to be about this number, um, and it's basically based on trying to balance uh, having balance balance this having enough factors in the fact enough primes in the factor base uh, to, to actually, so that the residues will actually factor over versus you know, being able to generate enough, not having to generate too many residues with a large factor base. Right? Uh, and, and so I think uh, all these logs, I think they're based on basically how long, how many times, like how many times you have to do this to hit you know, a residue that works. Uh, and so this, and uh, so, wait a minute. So this is pretty important, but you know, it's not the runtime. The runtime ends up as something like this. Uh, so this is kind of a kind of a mess. Um, and this is pretty similar to this. Um, and you know, th this number, depending on where you look, might be a little bit different. Uh, but so, what does this actually mean? Um, so. If, so it's, there's an exponential. So it's exponential in something, but uh, if if you consider b to be the number of bits or to be log of n, right? Um, everything you're doing is well, this is this is really the main part, right? And this that's and it's under a square root. So that's actually sub exponential. Uh, so it's it's not you're just dividing the number of bits by two like we had at the very beginning with trial division. You're actually taking the square root, and that matters a lot. So, um, so yeah, not being this is an exponential. That's really good. Um, it's not polynomial, uh, of course, but this is a lot better than what we had before. All right. Any questions? Okay. All right, so yeah, there's some improvements we can make on Dixon's algorithm. So the you know it's a really a lot of really nice ideas put together already uh, with trying different with combining different residues. But let's try to improve it. So uh, so here's some ideas. So one, let's try and square things that are really close to square root. Uh, that way, the residue. Um, when we take x, when we square it and we take mod n, it's actually just going to be x squared minus n. And, and hopefully, and hopefully that'll be pretty small. And if it, if it's small, you have a better shot at factoring it over some factor base that contains small primes than if it's large. Okay. 
Um, and then let's not just throw all the primes up to some bound in the factor base. Uh, we're going to pick our primes wisely. So let's, in particular, so we're choosing P such that this, this quadratic equation here has solution. Okay, so n again is the is this super large number we, we're given, right? And we're basically asking if n has a square root mod p. Okay. So it's not, it's different. We're not asking if n itself is the perfect square, but mod p, is there something that's is there some perfect square that has the same remainder as n? Okay, and so why is this? So, uh, so let's say we had one solution to this, right? Um, and then let's say we add p to it, or any really any factor of p, um, or sorry, any multiple of p to 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 our solution, and and then we compute the residue from that. And it turns out uh, that you know a bunch of stuff goes away because these are both divisible by p. And an and x squared minus n, we already knew it was zero since x is a solution. So it turns out that x plus kp is also a solution for any k. So if you get one solution, um, you get a whole bunch of solutions. And so each of these values, uh, if, you, if you square them, uh, you subtract n, you get something that's a multiple of p. Uh, so yeah, so, so with by solving this equation once or this equivalent once, you get a lot of x at once. Uh, right, but this is only for one prime. So what else are we doing? So let's say let's say okay, so x is is our starting point, so it's the square root of n, and then we just generate our array an array of residues. Okay. And so, so we just so we're taking we're taking and so r again is just scoring it and this attacking n. So we're taking some number x zero squared minus n, x zero plus one squared minus n, and so on. Um, all right. Well, let's just say we started with p equals two. Right. So we first we're going to solve this system or sorry, solve, solve this equivalent. Um, and so you know either either n is odd or even. And so the, the solution is x if that is odd and um, or sorry, the solution is odd if n is odd if n is odd and even if n is even. Um, and so x zero it could be odd or even, but either x zero or x zero plus one is going to be a solution, right? Um, to to this equivalence. And so then we so let's just suppose that it's x zero. Uh, just it does you know if it's x zero plus one it does the same idea. And then we know that two divide is a factor of all of these. So, uh, so we can update our array by dividing the corresponding elements by. And, okay. and so and so all the elements get divided by two. Uh, every other element gets divided by two, right? So. And then we can repeat for other primes. So let's uh, so for so starting from you know three and going up, uh, we solve this equivalence. Get uh, if we find a solution, you get a whole bunch of solutions, and we divide the corresponding entries in the array by p. Um, so and again, this works because we know that the R of any of these solutions will be divisible by P. Okay. Uh, so this is this is where the, where the word C comes from right here. So if we uh, if we divide every we divide every second element by P, um, then or by two, right? Then divide every third element by three. Divide every fifth element by five. You know, assuming you know, assuming there's a solution to this equi equivalence for two, three, five. Right, and it's kind of like this, you know, the sieve of Eratosthenes, right? Uh, so, and so, what's the end goal? Uh, well, once an entry in the array reaches one, 
that means that residue fully factors over the primes p that we used. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, and actually, we can't solve this equivalence for all p. Uh, so we'll have to skip some of them. Or, but the, the ones that do work, we'll use for our factor base. Okay. So once we have enough residues that factor, um, we can make a system of equations again. And um, just like in Dixon's algorithm, and we can uh, we can use you know whatever way to solve it, uh, to find the combination that'll re result in a perfect square. And yeah, using difference of squares. So here's how the algorithm goes. Uh, so you first you initialize an array A uh, that hold information about about residues near squared event. Um, and then you generate the factor based on C. So you solve uh, solve this equivalence, add the prime to the factor base, um, and if it, if there's a solution, and then and then update the entries in A corresponding to the solution. Um, and as far as the update goes, you can either initialize you know all the residues and divide by divide by p every time, or you can start at zero and add like a log p um, each time you get a p that works That's until you get above above some special. Um, but yeah, the, the basically the basic. Um, and then the rest is exactly the same as Dixon's algorithm. So now we have. So we, we have enough um, we have enough residues that factor over the factor base, um, and and so we can make the system mod two find the solution, well combine the solution, and recover the factors of that. Okay. So yeah, that's the end. Uh, so. Uh, was if you if you pick the size of the factor base properly, um, and uh, and again it's the same it's the same sort of considerations from earlier. Um, the expected runtime is something is something like this, and uh, and you notice this value here, the square root of nine over eight. It used to be two square root of two, so um, I mean I guess this is this this is what we're going for when we're trying to improve this is the 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 runtime of these algorithms is, is this number right there um but this actually matters right uh oops i, I had i thought i had something here but this actually matters because uh because this is this is this is this number is in the exponent so you're taking whatever you're taking whatever you whatever else you had and then to the power of square root of nine over eight and square root of nine over eight is pretty close to one. Before it was two square root of two. You know that's a big difference to take something to the power of something just a little bit above one versus to the power of three or something, right? So and so this is actually a pretty big deal. Um, so how does this algorithm uh, do in practice? Um, so it's the second fastest known factoring algorithm right now. Um, the fastest is the general number field sieve. It's a lot more complex, kind of kind of built off of again the same it's a very similar ideas, but um, it's a lot more heavy machinery involved. Um, and for numbers under a hundred about a hundred digits, this is still the best algorithm. So yeah, this algorithm is. I mean, it seems it's. I mean, there's a lot to go through, but at the end of the day, it's not that complex. It doesn't involve any super advanced math, um, and yet it's still the best algorithm for numbers that aren't extremely extremely large. Um, so it was uh, it was the first to factor uh, RSA one twenty nine um, in nineteen ninety four. 
And you know, back then it you know we took a you know, took a long time. Uh, you had uh, factor based used you know about five five hundred thousand crimes, um, which is pretty big. But then again, the prime the number itself is also really big. Uh, so it's you know not that unreasonable. And uh, the whole like running and like collecting the data, running the algorithm, the data processing as well. It took a really long time, um, but. And this is, I think, the last RSA prime that was factored. That that this was the first effect. This algorithm was the first to factor. So after that, if you after you get into more digits, uh, the the general number field sieve uh, takes the record for those. Uh, but you know, we've come a long way since since RSA one twenty nine was factored in nineteen ninety four. Uh, according to Wikipedia, let's see. Uh, 2015, it was factored in about one day with an open source implementation using a commercial cloud computing service for about thirty dollars. So uh, it goes to show, you know, how much, how far we've come um, in terms of in terms of computing and uh, and also. All right. Yeah. So I think that's yeah. That's all I have. Uh, let's see. And there's a break he's on the next slide, but does anyone have any questions? Okay. Uh, there's a break I haven't really yet. Um but okay. Yeah, thanks for coming, everyone. Let's see. Uh, oh, okay. I don't know what I did. Uh, how do you stop recording? Okay.